Welcome to Multifamily Rockstars. If you are new to apartment investing or already experienced, you will enjoy this show. You will hear from the leading experts in multifamily real estate so that you can be a better owner, operator, and investor. Real people, real stories, life changing. And now, your host, Ryan Christopher Nunes. Welcome to today's show. We have Whitney Sewell. Whitney is the host of the Real Estate Syndication Show, a daily podcast that has been hugely inspirational for me and many real estate investors. He's also the founder of LifeBridge Capital and has 450 doors under management of roughly $50 million in assets. Whitney is passionate about adoption. He and his wife, Chelsea, have have adopted three children and he gives 50% of his profits to adoption. He is a veteran of the Army National Guard and spent 2005 deployed in Iraq. He was awarded the Soldier of the Year for his duty to our country. Whitney, welcome to our show, and thanks for your service. Wow, what an introduction. That just, (laughs) hard to believe some of that's happened. Just the Lord has been very kind. uh, Thank you very much, Ryan, for that, and uh, grateful to be here and, and to speak to you and your audience. Awesome. Well, let's get right into it. Walk us through your background. Tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Yeah, background. Wow. Um, you know, I, I would say I would start with after after high school, I joined the military. It was like 2001. I'll say I'll say March of 2001 because that's important because at that time, we had no idea that our nation was fixing to be at war, you know. Uh, and so in just a few short months, uh, we were, you know, I, I found myself, uh, you know, the country at war. And then uh, soon after spending a year of my life in Iraq, uh, you know, c- carrying around a machine gun, you know, never imagined, you know, something like that was actually going to happen, right? Uh, but we did, but I did, and spent a year over there. Um, you know, not everyone in my squad made it home. You know, and mm. and so you know, it's it very tough times. You know, for the, for our men and women that are serving. You know, in the military, I'm so grateful for them, um, of course. And and but uh, but thankful that I was able to serve. And one thing that I took from the military was what I like to call our, our never give up mentality. And so that was something that that you know, it's not an option to give up when you're at war. It's just, it's not an option, right? There's too many lives on the line. It's not okay. But, you know, coming home, trying to figure out what I was going to do, I, I got hired by Kentucky State Police. And still, that never give up mentality was, it was so important. And it had to show from the way I wore my uniform to the way that I responded to every dispatch. Lives were still on the line. And then, while I was a police officer, though, I had an income problem. And, you know, making thirty some thousand dollars a year or less, you know, and even then, you know, that's working every night, weekend and holiday. That's working all the overtime, signing up for all the overtime that I can get, mm. you know, and and maybe I make forty thousand then. You know, so I'm like, okay, you know, I've got to figure something out here. And so I, I was on a hunt then and, and I found real estate. And so I wasn't raised around entrepreneurs or real estate investors of any kind. But at that time I, I, I read different books, found Rich Dad Poor Dad amongst many others. And and but Big, a big part of what I learned there, though, was so many people had created wealth through real estate. I mean, a large portion of our, our wealthiest people, you know, are growing their wealth in real estate. And so, I thought, okay, you know, if, if this many people can do it, surely I can do it, too. Jumped in, bought a couple triplexes really quickly. That was in 2009 and learned a lot the hard way. Happy to get into as much of that as you want. Sure. But, but learned a lot the hard way, managing ourselves. Um, uh, but you know, it was, it was really early in our marriage, a uh, lot of, lots of stress around that, you know, but it was our own university and, and, uh, you know, lots changed obviously since then. Uh, but we kept buying, um, small, smaller multis and single family until, um, I got, I was, uh, I became a federal agent. So I I left state police, became a federal agent. That's what moved us to Virginia where we live now. And then I learned about the syndication business. And, I just couldn't believe that, that I hadn't known about this so many years before. I had no idea that this was even out there, but I did, and I just couldn't believe it. Uh, and so from the, the structure and discipline that I gained from military and law enforcement, you know, I, and seeing other guys that had done this, uh, you know, before and were buying 100 unit complexes and they had no experience in real estate, uh, you know, I thought, okay, 
you know, if they can do it, I can do it too. And so we jumped in completely to that business model, selling everything else, including another business and farm and everything to commit to this, to this uh, business, you know, of syndication. And now, you know, we've been in a few years now on the syndication side and commercial real estate and obviously the podcast, like you mentioned, and, and, you know, we're, we can get into as much of that as you want. Oh, that's fantastic. So uh, what uh, we walked through a little bit of why you decided to get into multifamily. Tell us what your goals are for 2020. Well, I would say uh, maybe they've changed a little bit over the last few weeks. <laughs> you know, as far as goals for 2020, I think my business partner and I, you know, a few weeks back would have said we'd love to do at least one to two more deals, maybe three more deals this year. Uh, but ultimately, now that, you know, what's happening in the market, what's happening with this virus and how that's affecting us, there, there's so many unknowns at the moment. And I think we still need about two weeks to a month, maybe before we really have a good feel what this is going to be. And even then, we may not know the full extent. However, I think we'll get a feel for if this is going to keep getting much, much worse or not. Um, it's going to be a, it's going to affect us all in a big way, in, no matter what market we're in. But it could, it's too good to still get a lot worse before it gets better. And so uh, ultimately a goal, you know, is for our properties to keep operating the best that we possibly can. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, so we can, but you know, we want to work with our tenants, you know, we don't want to um, have to kick people out that don't have jobs at the moment, you know, that are just now losing their jobs and we want to learn to operate as most efficient as we can. Uh, but while also taking care of our tenants, taking care of our investors uh, all at the same time. So, keeping our properties cash flowing as much as pro as possible uh, while also working with tenants, investors. And, you know, and we're still looking for deals. I won't say that we're closing that off, but I would say we won't be submitting any offers for probably another probably month to two months at a minimum. Hmm. Wait till the dust settles. Right. Right. Yeah. So I uh, wanted to jump in and talk about your podcast, which has been a huge inspiration to me and many others. And I uh, just wanted to talk about, you know, behind the scenes, what inspired you to start your daily podcast? So I only knew of one other real estate podcast that was daily and he's crushed it in just a few years. And so I thought, okay, you know, if that's, uh, I, you know, and I know him personally and we're friends and I, uh, I just thought, okay, you know, if he can do it, I can do it too. And, you know, and, and, and said, okay, let's, let's make it happen. Um, and so that, you know, doing a podcast, um, it, it's done so many things. I'm sure we're going to, we'll talk about it, but um, initially it was a way for me to just increase my network very, very quickly. Right. And, and educate myself too, all at the same time. It does so many things. Um, but you know, in that instance, like before, um, before a couple of years ago, I never imagined having a podcast. I mean, never even dreamed of it, never thought about being a podcast host, you know, but then when I said, when I seen that, okay, this is something that, that can help you scale and help you to just increase your network really quickly and um, said, okay, let's, where do we start? And how did you go from zero podcast to the first podcast? Maybe walk us through that big leap, that jump, that leap of faith, <laughs> if you will. It's so hard to get started. You know, like I get questions every week, people schedule calls and they want to know how to, how to do a podcast, how to get started. And, and it's, it's like laying out a plan. Ultimately, what all has to get done, figuring that out. Most of you can find for free online, uh, you know, how to, how to get started with a podcast. Um, but ultimately for myself, I talked to so many people who were already doing podcasts, just like you did, right? Uh, you know, I talked to so many people and asking questions and, you know, I, and they're telling me how much work it was, right? I mean, oh, it's so much work and can't seem to get it all done. Can't get the show notes done and all this. And, but they all had one thing in common and that was that they were all doing weekly shows. <laughs> So I really thought, okay, wait a minute, you know, am I really making a, a horrible decision here, you know, by, by thinking about doing a daily show and then, but also I would say I had a great coach, had a great mentor and that's where, you know, I, I would share those things with him and he's like, well, that's why you got to do it because nobody else is going to do it. Nobody else is going to put the work in. So mm -hmm. that's why you got to do it. And so I said, okay, we're going to keep pushing forward. And so how much time does it take you? Just maybe give us some color as to the, you know, what's happening, like wh where you are now, what you had to do to start it, how many people you have supporting your initiative. Mm. So initially, uh, it, it made me scale. I knew that there was no way that I could keep up with doing everything myself. It's not possible. 
it's not possible. Even a weekly show, I probably would have quit by now if I was doing it all myself. Okay. And I know that, right? And it's not, it's not the best use of my time anyway. So from the beginning, I built a team of virtual assistants. We had four virtual assistants from all over the world that were doing different things for the show almost every day. And then, you know, I had another assistant that was more like an executive assistant locally that, that would help me manage all that. And she did lots of things for me outside of the podcast as well, but she played a key role in helping manage all these people and all this, all the processes that we put in place to make that happen. But that, you know, we, I had to build that process, had to build that team ahead of time. And then I also had 60 shows recorded before I ever launched. Oh, amazing. Okay. So I, I expected, you know, kind of like, kind of like when we're preparing to buy a deal, we have to expect hiccups, right? We have to expect things like the coronavirus, even though we don't know what it's going to look like. You know, I expected there to be problems. So I got 60 days ahead. So that way, when that hiccup happened, our team had time to figure out what it was, correct it and keep going, you know, mm -hmm. before we missed any, any time. Um, and so that, anyway, I, I, I can't even remember what your question now was, but yeah. I think I hope I answered it. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, and then in terms of getting, you know, your first guests on the show, what was the sales mm -hmm. pitch to them? Yeah. So I think it was ultimately being very professional. So, um, you know, presenting our business, our brand very professionally, even our, the way the email that we send out inviting guests on the show, you know, we just tried to make that as professional as possible. We've changed stuff now, but a lot of people say, well, how did you get such good guests on really quick? And, and I think a lot of it was just our branding and our professionalism. And, and you had asked earlier about the time commitment, I think. Um, and, you know, one thing about, and I'll share about that as well was, it's an extreme amount of time. I mean, it takes so much time to do a daily podcast. I, um, you know, I, I usually have a couple, and I'll say this, you know, I did this while most people don't know this, uh, but I did this while working full time while also adopting our third child while also moving, you know, twice. I mean, um, you know, don't tell me you can't do it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so it, it's, is it, is it a crazy commitment? It is crazy. And, and I would say to know that your whole family has to be committed to it uh, because it's, it's not uncommon for me to be taking investor calls. So, you know, for the last two years, I've scheduled investor calls sometimes from like five to seven in the morning. Then I would go to work and I get home, say at four 30. And guess what? I still have investor calls and interviews until as late as I can get them. Okay. As late as I can get them. And that's what I've been doing for two years, but I'll also have a couple days a month that are just long recording days. And I may record a dozen shows in one day, back to back to back to back. And that's how we produce enough shows, you know, but, but you got to be willing to run a marathon, you know, to make that happen. Cause that's a crazy day. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's a crazy day doing that many shows, but we've done it. And, and, you know, my schedule's changing quite a bit now, but, uh, but we've had to be willing to do that for a significant period of time uh, to make that happen. And I would also stress the time commitment of my, of my spouse uh, and just her commitment level behind supporting me. Oh, that's great. Wouldn't have worked that's, without it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, and then what other way do you leverage freelancers to help with your show, whether on design, you talked about four VAs and one executive assistant, any other, any other tips or things that you've used that have been helpful? So, you know, just using them to do the podcast. Yes. In other ways, you know, if there's with, uh, with, with LifeBridge Capital, if there's ways. Yeah. You, you, you so know. I use, I use VAs for lots of things. And, and now I have some that I use, uh, you know, like often, you know, some of the same VAs if they have a specific skill, but you have to think about, you know, do I want help with a specific skill or is this somebody that's going to be like an executive assistant, you know, cause it's two totally different things and you're going to hire them totally differently. And so, you know, if I want somebody that's an executive assistant, well, you know, depending on what their role is, you know, if, if they have access to sensitive information or investor information, or if they're helping me with capital raises, things like that, well, I'm doing a background check. I'm doing a series of interviews. I mean, like there's lots of things like this is an employee. I mean, we're, you know, I'm going to know a lot about this person before they're going to have access to those types of things. Right. Mm. But if it's somebody like you need help with show notes, that's a totally different type of person or, you know, so, you know, I'm going to put out, I use Upwork almost to find everybody that I mm -hmm. use. Okay. And so, you know, I'll, I'll find somebody on there. I'll put a job description and your job description is so important. Be very mm -hmm. detailed. And I would, I would add too, put something in there that makes them respond a specific way. And so uh, like, and I, I put this big, long description to give you an example, excuse me. And in the last paragraph, I said, in the very, in the middle, just kind of randomly, just very quick, I said, if you're interested, submit a video application. Okay. And then I just kept talking, you know, in my description, like, uh, like I didn't even say anything about that. Okay. 
And then, you know, I'll see who actually submits a, you know, did you read it? Sure, <laughs> you know, sure. how motivated are you to, to work for me, you know, or to help me? Uh, I tell them to go to my website, you know, I tell them to do those things. And then I'll ask questions around how they think we could improve anything like that. And so I'll know, did you do your homework? You know, did you look at my website? Do you even know who I am before you submitted your, your copy and paste application? You know, um, and so things like that were very important. And so I did that once and I didn't get any, any videos. And then I did it again. And, and then I got four or five, you know, so mm -hmm. I would say, you know, don't just say the first time you put it out there that you'll get the right person, but it takes some practice. And, and you know, some, like I said, somebody doing show notes, you just need to know they're good at that. And then it's just a repetitive task, Sure. you know, sure. But somebody that's an executive assistant. Well, this is a, that's a totally different thing. And what are some of the biggest challenges you faced along the way? Schedule. <laughs> I would say schedule, you know, what we just talked about. And cause it's been, it, I can't stress the uh, commitment enough. And somebody asked me on an interview the other day, what's something that uh, like you didn't, that you wish you'd have known then that, or that you know now just about, what it took to get here. And I would say the commitment of my entire family or the sacrifice for my wife and my kids, you know, um, but it, it's that commitment level, uh, uh, you know, just the schedule that it's, it's taken for me to do this has been insane. I mean, it has, you know, and I've had to just be committed to just keep running the marathon, just keep going, keep going, keep going, you know, I mean, and, and, but not only me, my spouse as well, my wife, you know, she's had to be very committed and, and she has, she's been amazing. I couldn't have done it without her. That's for sure. But, you know, to, to commit to this many hours a week, you know, doing all these things and doing them well or as best I possibly can, everybody had to be committed. Uh, and that's, it's been a challenge, you know, like when, when is family time, you know, and ske blocking my schedule off. So, sure, you know, sure. nobody else can schedule a call with me because no, that's, that's when, you know, I'm, I'm committed to the family then. And Whitney, you had to talk a little bit about your career. Are you still working full-time or are you transitioning to, to multifamily full-time? So I, I am still working full-time. I am transitioning. Um, I, we wanted to have great health benefits and, and th going through our third adoption, I wanted to keep those benefits until our daughter got home. We knew she was, you know, good and healthy, all that stuff. Um, but then also uh, just the unknown in the market right now, you know, uh, I may stay another month or two, something like that. But, but ultimately, yes, I'm transitioning uh, full time. Okay. And then, uh, you know, talking about you've done, I don't know how many, how many shows have you done so far? Over 530. Okay. 530 shows. So of those 530, what, what was your favorite podcast that you've done? Oh man. <laughs> that is so hard to do. That is so hard. Um, yeah, I, I probably can't pick out just one. I, you I have probably, a few favorite, you know, um, a few memorable ones. I do have a few memorable ones and I would say it's, it's probably with, uh, I won't mention a name, but, uh, um, but with, with people who, will really share their real story about how they got where they're at. There's a, there's a couple, there's a few shows, or I would say there's numerous, but, but, and I, and I almost shared it myself already too, but it's just like, it's not as easy as what everybody makes it, it makes it out to be right. Sure. You know, and I just encourage a guest as well, like be real, you know, like don't paint this like crazy picture, you know, of sitting on the beach. Maybe you're sitting on the beach now, but it wasn't <laughs> that way the first couple of years. Right. <laughs> Sure, you know, sure. and those are some of my, some of my favorite shows and, and people expect like this, this amazing piece of advice that's going to get them the next level. And what I find, like, even through my own show, it's, it's my own personal development that really like just keeps improving. And I just see improvement in our business and in my personal life. And, 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 and I mean, and professionally as well, because of those things. And, and those are the guests that I really enjoy uh, because, it, you know, whether we're talking about how to structure a syndication deal or what, I mean, there's lots of operators that come on the show and we talk about those things, but, but really like, I want to know how you, how you bettered yourself personally you know, and, and cause ultimately, I mean, when I started focusing on personal developments, when I started seeing my business take another level. Sure. Sure. So if we switch gears to multifamily and some of the deals that uh, you and, and your partner have looked at, uh, what's your perfect deal? What, if you were to put, you know, qualities in, into a perfect box, what would fall into that? I don't know if there's a perfect deal. <laughs> you know, I, I would say there's, um, there's definitely, things that has to happen before we're going to pursue a deal. 
Um, you know, whether that's a preferred return or whether that's a certain IRR and, and even that's subject to change. Right. And we're, mm -hmm. you know, everybody in the industry is learning that right now. Right. Um, but, and I would say, you know, uh, and just to give you some guidelines there, sure. we want at least 8% preferred return. We want to IRR in the high teens that are that over a five year hold, things like that. You know, I mean, just to be really basic, sure. but, but, you know, also at the same time, we want to be, we want to have a, a large reserve budget while also being able to provide those same returns, right? We, we want to be able to have that money up front, you know, and, and for an example, I mean, we closed on a deal just last week, 216 units. And, you know, in the middle of all this craziness, right, or right when it started heating up, it seems. Uh, and so, but day one, we have a million and a half dollars in a reserve budget. Yeah. And so, you know, I just like to say that to say, you know, like being conservative isn't just, it's something everybody says, but like now we're going to learn pretty quickly who was conservative or, or was not, sure. you know, Absolutely. you know, six months from now, potentially. Sure. Um, and so, um, so it's, it's those deals where we know that, okay, you know, it meets these parameters. We still have a, a reserve budget. We have the correct financing. I mean, like, you know, everything we can see, every ma massive risk we can negotiate or, you know, mit 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 mitigate right here, you know, pretty quickly. Okay. Um, and those are going to be some of the perfect deals, you know, and uh, to get to the type of deal, it's going to be B and C class, mostly C class for us. So I'll say C okay. plus, uh, not, not in, not in anywhere we have to wear a bull bulletproof vest, but they're usually C class because of just the vintage, you know, but they're still really nice properties. Um, so, but 150 plus units, 150 plus anything on the demographic side that you look for or location of the asset. Great question. And uh, I'm, you know, I really want more steady, um, job growth or population growth, things like that. Uh, you know, I want to be able to see, um, you know, one, one place we really like, or like Colorado Springs is a, is a city that we're investing in. And, you know, like we can show population growth there for a hundred years. Okay. Is mm -hmm. it, uh, is it as big as Denver? Well, no. Um, but it's very steady. It's very, very steady and has been, um, you know, over a very long period of time, you know, through many recessions and things like that, you know, or do you see, a, you know, um, that the U or V dip or something like that? Yes, but, but uh, you know, over a period of time, it, it, it has great, a great history, you know, of growth, um, but whether it's jobs, whether it's um, population, uh, but also obviously employers in the area. Um, there's some really large employers there. Amazon's building the largest warehouse there uh, within two miles of a couple of our properties. Uh, it's the largest warehouse in Colorado and seven surrounding states, um, wow. you know, close to the airport in, in uh, Colorado Springs. Uh, and, you know, so obviously that's somebody, you know, we love, you know, having the Amazon that close, you know, sure. and building a facility that size. Uh, and and I, I would like to think that they, um, do more research on a market than we ever could. Sure. Absolutely. And then are there any automatic deal killers for you where, whether it's asset type or anything about the asset that you're like, Hey, we're staying away from that. Well, you know, going back to the market a little bit, you know, populations that are just a hundred thousand people or less, or, you know, potentially 200,000 or less, we're, we're probably not going to consider, um, you know, or just looking at markets like that, depending on what's happening. But as far as a deal killer, um, Ultimately, really quickly, if we think we can't meet those returns and, and, you know, on a very conservative population growth, we'll say like two and a half percent, sometimes three percent, depending on the market, um, you know, we're, we're not going to pursue it. Um, and, and then we're really going to stick to that. And so um, you know, this, this past deal that closed, it was, it was presented to us in June. And, the, you know, the broker, he came to us and, and we just said, no, you know, it's way overpriced. We think this is where we would be at. And, and we told him. And we didn't make an offer. We didn't submit an LOI, but we just were very upfront, said, no, it's way overpriced. And so it went under contract with another group, falls out of contract. You know, he comes back. We say, no, it's still overpriced, <laughs> you know. And then, you know, a few months later, he comes back and we say, you know, this is where we're still at. You know, this is what the property's worth. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up getting it, you know, for really That's close great. to that. Okay. That's so, great. but, you know, a few million less than what the other group had under contract for. So, but I say that to, to say, you got to have patience right? I mean, you got to have patience. Um, we, we, we're going to stick to those numbers and we're going to uh, be conservative. There's groups in that area that are, that we're underwriting large groups uh, to four and a half percent rent growth. And I like, it just blows my mind, sure, you know? Sure. Um, and so, you know, we were less than 3%, you know, and still got the deal. And we're thankful now that we did. 
Yeah, no, that's great. Congratulations again. That's exciting. And then uh, walk us through some, you know, whether this deal or a previous deal, some of the things that went right, some of the things that might not have gone according to plan. Yeah, you know, um, one big thing with this, I would say with this specific property was, was the seller. You know, he had certain things that he had to get done. Uh, I won't go into too many details, but, but there were, there were specific things that we had laid out that he had to have done before we could close. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're, we're just one or two weeks before closing a week before closing. And then we get, you know, and he still has not made any effort, you know, to, to do these things mm -hmm. that, that he knew he had to get done. Right. Um, but I was, I'm grateful for our relationships with our lenders and with our broker and things like that, that we were still able to close it. We had to push it out a few weeks, okay. you know, but ultimately waiting on him, Every, everything was done on our side. Legal mm -hmm. was done. You know, our loan had been approved by, by the committee, uh, many things like that. But, but I think if we hadn't have been very on top of it personally and had our, our ducks in a row or, you know, our things done that it could have potentially killed the deal you know, especially with the market or, uh, you know, what we're heading into right now with coronavirus and lending potentially going on a halt for a lot of lenders uh, that, that we probably would have been uh, halted for 30 days or potentially not closed. Um, and so, you know, that, that's a few things that we didn't expect there. Um, you know, I would say, you know, there's other, there's another property there that's really close to this. Um, you know, even things like when I talk about being conservative, and, and it's so relevant right now. Well, like the two bedrooms, for instance, were renting for around uh, 925, 950 when we took the property over. We underwrote for around, around taking those to 1050. And within about six months, they were, they were uh, some of them were turning just massive, okay, which is an amazing, um, you know, return uh, or, you know, rent growth. However, we're so thankful we didn't underwrite to 1250 now. Mm right? You know, so if we do have to lower rents, we, we can, and we can even still make our projections, you know, our, our, the returns that we projected. So, um, yeah, so a couple of good things, a couple of bad things. Uh, you know, the worst thing, worst property I ever purchased was the first one, those two triplexes. <laughs> and that was lack of, of proper due diligence. Um, you know, I hired a guy, I hired a guy that was with a very reputable company and I followed him around every nook and cranny of the property, attic, crawl space, whatever. And, but, you know, I didn't hire specialized people for HVAC or roofing and things like that. You know, did this guy tell me if they were working? Yes. But that was about it, <laughs> you know, I, you know I, and I didn't know any better, honestly, at the time. And so, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't take into account, well, okay, these ACs probably have about two more years, you know, or I better be planning to replace them or whatever it may be, you know, or even self-managing, you know, just how much time that was going to take. Um, so we got around university really quickly, really quick, quickly sure, there. Sure. Um, but, uh, but anyway, obviously we have better teams and better systems now, but learned a lot the hard way. So would you self-manage again? No. And why not? Uh, just the, the brain damage. <laughs> the end probably not it's just not the not the best thing for me uh, when i can when i can hire professionals work with professional management uh, they're going to do it better than i ever could anyway and i'm going to do tasks in our business better than they're going to do so you know i'm going to focus on on my roles and what i need to do and then i'm going to hire the, the professionals and potentially we may have our own management company someday but it's still going to be other professionals that are better at those tasks than i am Okay. No, I appreciate that. So, you know, we touched a little bit upon this. You just closed your deal last week, the coronavirus hits. So what are you all doing to prepare um, for, for the potential impacts in the fallout from coronavirus? Great question. So, you know, business plans have to change, right? Um, you know, whether we were planning, obviously we were planning to do lots of renovations and, and uh, you know, lots of improvements to the property. Uh, and I would say, there's things that will still happen, especially must, you know, things that, that are must, uh, especially if they're safety hazards or uh, just even cleanup, you know, just simple, like the, the property had a lot of trash around it, you know, and we're going to fix, I mean, it's, we're going to fix things like that. Um, but, or whether it's uh, hand railings that need to be fixed or things inside of specific tenant or uh, units that need to be fixed uh, for safety or for just use, um, you know, we're going to fix those things. Um, you know, are we going to, uh, you know, paint every exterior now, or are we going to do things like that, you know, that are just cosmetic? Um, you know, probably not. 
you know, uh, the, the common areas and, and pools and things like that are not going to be used, you know, probably for a while now. So that's areas too that, that are not going to be improved right away. Mm. Right. And so, you know, we don't know the full extent of what's going to, what this is going to bring on us and say, you know, two months, you know, from now. And so I think in a couple of weeks or towards the end of this month, uh, and then especially towards the middle of next month, um, you know, we're going to get a better feel for our delinquencies and how many people can't pay, how many tenants are losing their jobs. Our management companies are going around um, or, or one way or another and trying to fi fill out, you know, how many tenants are going to lose their job? Where do you work at? You know, and documenting these things so we can kind of get a feel to what to, for what to expect a month from now. You know, things like that. So trying to be proactive. Where do you work at? Do you feel like you're going to lose your job? We're not, we're not planning to kick you out because of it. However, we still have to pay, pay our bills, you know? And so we're trying to figure those things out. I know some people are, real, are reaching out to their lenders to see if lenders will, you know, give them a break for a few months. And I, you know, and, I, and we're going to reach out and say, you know, what's the plan? You know, what, how are you all helping these owners? You know, how, you know, if it comes to that, you know, sure. uh, and, and then because we want to be able to pass that along to our tenants as well. And even, you know, my business partner and I are, are, are developing a plan now. So personally, you know, we, we're deb uh, debating about giving every tenant like a hundred dollar gift card to, to uh, mm. the grocery store or yeah. something yeah. like that, you know, just to show we care to provide them a little bit of relief. Obviously that's not much, but you're talking this many tenants. That's a lot of money, sure. you know? So, sure. so, but you know, if, if lenders will, will give a break in some way, then we want to pass that right along to the tenants as well. If we could give them half a month for free or even a whole month for free or two months, half, you know, we want to be able to do that to help support them. It's a hard time. And we just feel like, you know, we just feel like um, biblically as well, we just feel like we sure. should help them if we can. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. And, you know, you had mentioned that uh, you're kind of waiting a month or two to see how the storm passes before, you know, offering on properties. Um, any, any thoughts as to when are the, the signs for you to say, you know, things are cleared up, we're ready to to, to review more deals, what, what's, what are going to be the markers for let's keep pursuing opportunities? Great question. Um, and I don't have a great answer as far as a timeline or even the markers, you know, like it's so unknown right now. Um, you know, I want to see that the virus is, is taken care of or it's under control or people, consumers are, are people are operating again right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the markets are going back again, or uh, we're, you know, we're kind of on the upscale again, right? And, you know, um, Neil Bawa, you know, talks about it being a, a really deep V, you know, meaning that we're going to go down really quick, and but it's going to be really far down. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to come back. And, and so I just think there's going to be things that have to happen first. Um, you know, I, I mean, multifamily, we live off of, uh, I mean, the, the tenants have to have jobs, right? They have to have income. Um, and so if there's no jobs, you know, we can't see pursuing another deal just yet, you know, if people aren't, aren't able to work. Uh, and so, you know, it's going to have to be soon or, or the country's going <laughs> to see a massive meltdown. Right. Sure. But, um, but, you know, there's going to be some things like that that are going to tell us, okay, you know, things are picking back up. We need to, we need to make some stuff happen. Nice. And then if we just shift gears to partnership, how did you meet your, your partner, Sam? Yeah. So Sam and I, I was at a, uh, I was at a conference and I was um, uh, networking and meeting as many people as possible, of course. And I was at a sitting around a table, a large table one night, and heard a guy talking about his faith, his family, and you know, I, and and also yeah, I heard things that uh, told me that he had skills that that were complementary to me. Okay, and I thought, okay, you know, my and my wife and I had been praying for a business partner for a long time, mm -hmm. and I had uh, I'd been asked by lots of people to partner, lots. And I mean, at one time, it's like numerous times a week, like somebody's calling mm. to talk about a deal or wanting to partner on a deal. And, and ultimately I said no to everybody. I'd partnered with one guy, uh, not permanently, but just on a couple deals. We'd done a couple deals together. Um, but you know, to say, you know, okay, I'm going to partner with you and we're going to go do this together. I mean, I really treated it like a marriage, mm. you know? And so my wife and I, uh, were just praying about what that should look like, who that should be. And so when I heard this guy talking about his faith and his family and just things like that, like I could see, okay, you know, he's got some characteristics that just seem like somebody I would partner with. And we had another meal together and then with amongst other people. And then the last night of the conference, um, you know, I asked, I, I met with Sam and, and, and I, I say, you know, why don't we have some coffee? And I just really put it out there. I just said, you know, my wife and I've been praying for a partner for a long time. You seem to fit that bill. 
Um, not to say it's going to happen, but if you're, if you're open to a partnership, I would love to discuss that with you or us get to know one another. And so that was, um, that was really a turning point. Okay. So at that time uh, we were in his hometown uh, where this conference was and uh, he ended up taking me to the airport and it was like 10 or 11 at night. And we went, we were going past his house. He took me by his house. I met his wife. And, uh, and, and when I got there, it's like 11 o'clock at night and she had homemade bread and coffee ready for me. So I, I, I knew it was meant to be. It was meant to be. <laughs> that was it. It was over with. <laughs> so, uh, but ultimately, we like we really thought strategically about that, and we both were uh, very business minded, very you know thinking about it being like a marriage, and just prayed about it together as well. But then we had numerous Zoom calls with us and our spouses all together for hours, wow. numerous times, just asking any question that we could think of, knowing that's I mean this is what we're doing. We're really entering almost a marriage here, okay? Mm. And so we had, I mean, we just really wanted to lay out any questions we had. I even went back to his house and stayed for three or four days just to get to know them. Wow. Okay. You know, I mean, ultimately stayed in their house, you know, just to get to know them and interact with their family and their kids and, you know, all those things, meet, go to church with them, you know, just numerous things before we finally said, okay, you know, we're, we're, we're putting the rings on, you know, whatever wow. we're, you know, we're moving forward, you know, with this together. And so, but ultimately that's how we met and vetted each other. And now, you know, we've just, uh, it's really helped us to skyrocket being able to say, okay, these are your roles. These are mine. This is what you're good at. This is what I'm good at. And, and now we're not having to do everything on our, on our own. That's great. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the roles that each of you plays and how that partnership works so well. Sure. Sure. So, you know, Sam is, is really good with numbers. Uh, I call him our walking calculator. <laughs> and so, you know, he's, um, he's really good with numbers, really good at Excel. And, and we, we've got a lot better software now that helps us to underwrite deals and stuff, but, but still, um, you know, I trust his, uh, his ability and underwriting. Uh, and so now he does pretty much all the underwriting until he finds something that, uh, um, that, that we should pursue. And then we look at it together. And so instead of me having to do the, the, uh, I do investor relations and all that stuff, of course, and marketing, but, but instead of me having to do all that underwrite deals, trying to do due diligence, asset management, all these things, we split those roles. He's boots on the ground, you know, where our properties are. And so, you know, while I may be there once a quarter, you know, sometimes more often, depending on if I'm there for a conference or something, um, you know, he's there with the management company and then I'll usually be on the phone or virtually or something like that. But, but he's boots on the ground there. You know, while, while we're both looking for deals at times, uh, I'm more the investor relations guy and, and he's our boots on the ground. He's underwriting deals and asset management. Um, and so, and, you know, we both play a role in each of those roles, I would say, but, but we both know, like, this is your focus you know, sure. this is your focus, you know, and then I have a, I have an assistant, you know, that's an amazing, that's amazing as well. And, and a lot of the roles that I used to try to do too, even around the podcast or capital raising, whatever that may be, you know, she takes a lot of that off my plate now as well. Um, and so that's been a, that's been a massive help. Yeah, that's great. That's fantastic. So as we, uh, we go into the wrap up stage here, uh, what advice do you have for people getting into the business, both passives and first time syndicators? At the moment, unless you have a really good relationship with an operator, just wait a couple months, <laughs> you know, just like see what's going to happen here. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say you have to not, you know, like not invest. I mean, I still feel like, I mean, look what happened to the stock market. You know, you probably just lost 30% of whatever you had in there, you know, but I feel like, like, I mean, and this is a great example of if you owned real estate, you know, are, are we going to take a hit? Well, of course, but we still own the property. We're still operating a business, you know, and, and we're, st we still are operating a successful business, you know, that, that we can bring back. Uh, and then ultimately if your operator plan for the type of things like this, we're going to be just fine. You know, we're going to be just fine. So wait, wait a couple months, assess the situation, see what it's going to be like. But this is also a great time for you to be calling operators. And, so, and, and, and this gives you a whole nother list of questions to be able to vet operators. I mean, it's just an amazing time right now for you to vet an operator. Mm -hmm. If you haven't invested passively or even if you have, because I'm going to be calling and saying, you know, to, to an operator and saying, okay, you know, tell me, let's talk about a deal that you recently did. And then I'm going to say, okay, what, you know, what did you under, what was your rent assumptions or your expense, expense assumptions and growth and all, all these things. And, and then what is it now? you know, and, and how is that, how is that business plan changing, you know, since you don't know what 
your, sure. your cash flow is going to be next month. Sure. You know, or how do you know what that's going to be? Or how are you planning for that? You know, what's happened? How, how's your management company responding to these things? You know, what's, you know, and it's just a great time to be asking those questions to see how their properties are performing, you know, even in a dip like this or potential dip that's fixing to come. You know, and how were you prepared? What type of debt did you have? What were your reserves? And, and you know, those things that are so important uh, when this actual, uh, you know, actual event happens. You know, how were you conservative and tell me? So ask those questions. Get to know operators. Uh, you know, maybe invest the, the minimum amount in a, in a couple deals with a couple different operators and, and that you trust. And, and you're going to learn so much by doing that. No, that's, uh, that's great. Great input. Great advice. And then what about your biggest lessons learned from your time in multifamily? I still go back to uh, it's personal development. Um, you know, there's so many things on the real estate side that I learn almost every interview that I do. Uh, but I would say personal development has been massive for me. Um, and I, and even and if I go back a few years, I can, you know, even when I just started creating a routine of reading in reading some specific books, like I can remember, like it just changing the way I think changing my routine, my schedule, you know, so I can be more consistent at some specific things, you know, and then it's just being consistent over a long period of time. You know, it, it, you, you can change maybe for a day or two, but when you can improve you know, yourself personally, and, and you do this over a long period of time, you really start to, to just compounding interest almost, you know, like it sure. just start, you start building up momentum, right, that you didn't have before. And so it's that change, you know, and, and just when I look back to the community I grew up in, the friends that I had, think, you know, and I think about, okay, like, I had to change personally, I had to grow professionally in a big way and personally before bigger, you know, things were going to change for me outside of myself. Uh, sure. And so that's, that's what's happened for me, even to help, you know, our multifamily business grow like it has. Uh, it started with, started with me personally. Whitney, again, thanks so much for your time. This was just a fantastic interview and it was such an honor to have you on the show. Uh, how can our listeners get in touch with you? You can email me, Whitney, at lifebridgecapital.com. You can call or text me at 540-585-4338. I would love to talk to you, help you any way I can. Awesome. Well, Whitney, thanks again. This was, uh, this was fantastic and really appreciate your time. My pleasure, Ryan. It's been a pleasure to get to know you as well and watch your growth in the business. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to Multifamily Rockstars. We hope this episode was helpful for your personal and professional growth. For more episodes and to learn more about investing in multifamily apartments, check out lifechangingcapital.com.